culture of care improves preterm survival. My name is Nelly Mugo. I'm your moderator for this webinar. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and a research scientist at the Center of Clinical Research at the Kenya Medical Research Institute, um, KEMRI, and I was a co-investigator for this preterm birth initiative project. So I'll start off by giving you a brief agenda of the session and what you should anticipate from this webinar. Um, so the first part, um, and we'll have various presenters walking through this agenda, we'll, we'll present uh, what the background was for this work and frame it for you. And we'll give you an overview of the package of intrapartum um, interventions that was introduced. And then you'll have the primary study results and we'll have a moment for questions and discussions. So be prepared and we'll have the closing remarks given by Professor Irene Inouye. Next, please. So it's a real pleasure to introduce my colleagues who are the principal investigators for this initiative. And as I introduced them, you'll notice that this work was led by public health specialists, obstetricians, and pediatricians. So we have the first presenter who will present this work will be Dr. Felgona Otieno, who's my colleague from the Center of Clinical Research at Kemri. She's a principal research scientist and pediatrician, and she was the principal investigator for the Kenyan program. Then we have Dr. Peter Waiswa, who led the Makerere Uganda arm of the work, who's an associate professor of health policy planning and management at the School of Public Health at the Makerere University College. And he served as the principal investigator um, for the preterm birth initiative in Uganda. Then we have Dr. Willis Walker. And Dr. Dillis Walker is a professor of obstetrics and gynecologist and reproductive health sciences at the Institute um, for Global Health Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She's also a co-founder of the Pronto International, which you'll hear about more during today's presentations. And she served as a principal investigator for the preterm birth initiative, East Africa. We'll um, have our next group of presenters who were really critical to the success of this work. The first presenter in this group will be Professor Anthony Wanyoro, who's an associate professor in obstetrics and gynecology at Kenyatta University. He also served with me as a co-investigator for the PTBI Initiative Kenya and led the team on data strengthening and safe childhood, safe childbirth checklist interventions for this study. Kevin Achola led this work on the ground. He's a public health practitioner and he served as the program manager at Migori. Then we have Annette Osimbo. Annette is a nurse midwife currently working in Kakamega County. And for PTBI Kenya, she was the lead pronto mentor. So um, with those brief introductions, we will, um, we, we will dive in. Um, oh, sorry, I thought Irene was coming at the end. So Dr. Dr. Irene Inwani, a long-term colleague and friend who's currently the Senior Director of Clinical Services at Kenyatta National Hospital, is also a pediatric specialist and a well-renowned scientist, actually, in prevention of mother-to-child transmission. And she served as a board member for the National Board um, for the PTBI Kenya program. So as we, as, as we dive into this work, I wanted to frame this work. So this study, the PTBI program, is really an excellent example of implementation science work which was conducted in real life settings, both in government and faith-based um, facilities, both in Kenya and Uganda. So I'd like to highlight a few really important points that I'd like you to pay attention to. That this was a multifaceted package of interventions which were based on local context. The implementers of the interventions were the actual healthcare providers on site giving services with, some, with support from the project staff. And they represented frontline providers in reproductive health and pediatric care, 
with the doctors, the nurses, and the midwives, as well as facility leadership and administrators. So the, this program relied primarily on routine health service data collected by the um, health system that created a path towards improvement in data quality, local capacity strengthening, and sustain sustainability. Implementation continued in the face of high staff um, turnover. And at the same time, at least in Kenya, we had a major doctors and nursing strike. So with this context, I hope you'll appreciate how this team executed a robust scientific trial, which is currently published in Lancet Global Health in a real world setting with sustainability in mind. So I hope this sets for all of us the agenda to celebrate the World Prematurity Day. This work helped to improve outcomes for many preterm babies and their families. So to initiate this presentation, it's my pleasure to once again call upon Dr. Felgona Otieno, our Kenyan PI, to set the ball rolling. Welcome, Felgona. Thank you very much, uh, Nelly, for that introduction. And uh, as we celebrate the World Prematurity Day, we are actually really delighted to share with you the results of our recently accomplished and published project uh, on the, uh, the preterm birth. This study explored the impact of an intrapartum and immediate newborn care package as Nelly has uh, clearly framed. Uh, and this, we are going to look at the outcomes that uh, we will be expressing in terms of the fresh stillbirths and the preterm survival. So this work was done in Kenya and Uganda, and therefore I believe that as we celebrate the prematurity day, we are all interested in looking at factors and, and those uh, factors that can end or mitigate this bias. Next slide. Preterm birth uh, is the leading cause of neonatal mortality, followed by intrapartum related events. If you put the two together, we see that over 50% of all neonatal deaths globally are contributed by preterm birth or intrapartum related events. Next. Just to look uh, at this, the NAP or Every Newborn Action Plan and strategic objective. This NAP was rolled out in 2014, and it is indeed one of the global efforts to reduce neonatal mortality and fresh steel rates. A major part of this strategy, as you can see, focuses around the facility-based existing uh, evidence-based interventions during labor and immediate, immediately after. Therefore, targeting this critical window period in combination has been estimated to save the most lives. Next. So what did we do? We conducted an unblinded pair mite cluster randomized control trial. In Kenya, worked in Migori County with the Ministry of Health as well as, uh, of course, Kemri. In Uganda, we worked in Busoga region with Makerere University and the, and the Minister, uh, Ugandan Ministry of Health. Our interventions were delivered at the facility level and focused on quality of care around the time of birth and immediate postpartum period. The study was implemented in 16 health facilities in Migori and uh, four health facilities in Toga region. As you can see this slide, uh, the two regions are, are similar in so many ways, uh, geographically, uh, the same belt, and uh, also in terms of the health indicators, in terms of child survival, you can see they are more or less similar. Next slide. So just a bit, uh, I'll introduce our components of, uh, of the package, but I'll have others uh, dive deeper into this. So the four components of our package included uh, data strengthening, modified safe childbirth checklist, quality improvement, collaboratives, 
and proto simulation and team training. Next slide. So the, the facilities were then divided into control and intervention. The control facilities received two of the interventions of the package, named data strengthening and modified safety checklist, and the intervention facilities. Next slide. The intervention facilities received uh, four components. So on top of data strengthening and modified safety checklist, we added to this the quality improvement, collaboratives, and frontal simulation uh, and team training. And uh, just to mention that uh, the pronto simulation and team training was adapted to pre and bath uh, setting. Slide. What was our hypothesis? The hypothesis was that the full intervention package would reduce the combined incidence of fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among pre infants by 30% compared with the incidence in the control group. As you can see from this uh, conceptual model, it illustrates that theory of change would be based around the improved quality of care. Next slide. So our primary outcome was combined fresh stillbirth and totality among eligible infants. And defined eligible infants for this study as uh, their that they will be live and registered fresh till birth uh, with a birth weight of 1,000 grams to 2,500 grams. Or if they had um, a birth weight of 300 grams, they would also need to have a gestational age below 37 weeks. Did this so that we could be able to get the most vulnerable babies, baby by birth weight or gestational age without using a lot of resources to have healthy and late preterms who are likely to be uh, term babies. For our analysis, we conducted an intentional treat logistic regression, adjusting for pairing and cluster using robust standard uh, error estimates. Next slide. These intervention components were introduced in a staggered fashion with data strengthening and modified safety checklist uh, coming in first and later pronto and quality improvement were added. Data collection in Uganda ended in December 2018 in Kenya due to the eight-month nurses strike. The study was extended until May 2019. So basically um, our components were rolled out in a dual component with um, you know, issues like industrial strike, varying uh, volumes of delivery, and staff turnover rates. Next slide. The slide um, that is shown next just gives us a glimpse into the environment where we work. As you can see, um, cold rooms can be this disorganized, and even maternity wards can be very crowded. Delivery rooms may sometimes not offer a lot of privacy, and uh, infants in the newborn can be very crowded. This is real life setting in some cases. Next slide. I therefore just want to uh, invite uh, uh, Professor Anthony Wanyoro to discuss with us our first two interventions, data strength and modified safety of our checklist. Welcome, Dr. Wanyoro. Uh, thank you, Philgona. Uh, our first intervention uh, for all facilities, as you have heard, uh, was data strengthening. Next slide. So together with our funders, uh, we committed to use existing data systems rather than creating parallel ones. This ensured that uh, pre term birth initiative uh, strengthened data systems in the facilities uh, for sustainability. We relied on the maternity register and the patient charts uh, as our main data sources. Next slide, please. So uh, basically, uh, we recognized the indicator definition challenges exist among healthcare providers and uh, 
we conducted workshop uh, to ensure the, that the providers understood uh, indicator definitions and standardization. We put uh, extra emphasis, especially uh, for critical preterm birth indicators, such as the birth weight, uh, gestational age, APCA score, and uh, of course the discharge status. To improve on gestational age assessment, uh, we provided gestational uh, wheels as uh, in the previous slide and tape measures and we also trained the uh, midwives on the use of uh, uh, the tools. The data team uh, made monthly uh, facility visits to collect birth register data throughout uh, uh, the, the period uh, of, of our study and they also uh, used this time to assess uh, the data for accuracy and its completeness and to give feedback uh, to the provider so that the data can, uh, could uh, be improved and the gaps that they had identified uh, could be discussed and, uh, and a way forward uh, found. As we did this, we also uh, renovated uh, record uh, storage rooms that you can see uh, on the top of this slide uh, that looked a bit chaotic and we could not or you could not easily be able uh, to uh, get uh, records. So we renovated 12 of, the, or 12 of uh, record rooms so that we can enhance accessibility uh, of the records. At the same time, uh, we created a dashboard. Uh, this dashboard was to allow uh, the, the healthcare providers to be, used, uh, to be able to use locally generated uh, data uh, to make uh, decisions on management of patients. The midwives and uh, the HRIOs were, uh, uh, they were mentored on the use of the data, uh, the, the, the data dashboard and uh, to get confidence in, their, in the, its usage. During the study period, uh, we conducted three data quality assessments and these were mainly uh, geared to look at the concordance of data between the reported data and the data that uh, was uh, generated within the, uh, the charts and also the maternity register and to see how the trends over time on the, uh, on the concordance uh, uh, occurred. Next slide. So who did we target for our data strengthening uh, activities? One, uh, we targeted the maternity ward and the newborn care providers. And as you would agree, these are the people who generate data. And we also targeted the HRIOs, the health records officers and other staff, as well as the facility administrators who are basically supposed to be the custodians of data and who are supposed to look at the quality of data and give feedback uh, to the uh, people who generate the data. We aim to uh, do these activities for at least one to two hours every month uh, in the facilities, in all the facilities. And uh, as I've said, we also did three data quality assessments. Next. So our next intervention that was given to all the facilities was the modified safe childbirth checklist. And what we did was that we look, assessed the WHO safe childbirth checklist, which is a tool used to improve maternity and newborn uh, outcomes. And when we assessed this, we identified gaps in need that were related to the care of preterm births. We then embarked on aligning it uh, with the national guidelines, adding a new uh, post point, which we called the triage uh, prior to admission. And the triage basically was to effectively identify preterm births, uh, preterm labor, and identify candidates who are uh, due for antenatal corticosteroids, magnesium sulfate, and or early uh, referral to a facility that could handle uh, a preterm uh, uh, baby. 
we also ensured that the uh, modified safe child by checklist had enough distribution and we incorporated within the uh, patient chart. Next slide, please. So who are the, our target uh, for the modified uh, safe child by checklist? Uh, we targeted the maternity ward and the newborn uh, care providers because these were the people who are supposed to check or at every point of care of a mother who presents with preterm birth uh, on the things that have been uh, needed to be done. At the same time, we did this uh, for at least one to two hours per facility uh, every month. And this was done by our, our, our mentor and nurses. Additionally, for in the intervention sites, we did more enforcement uh, of the modified safe child by checklist with the QI and the proto activities. I will hand over to Annette uh, to give us on the pronto activities. Thank you, Prof. So pronto was one of the interventions. What is pronto? Uh, pronto is a Spanish word meaning quicker. And as the word goes, it just activates quick action to the care providers during an emergency. So we introduce simulation and team training to give providers team the opportunity to practice critical care in a safe environment. The curriculum included 12 simulation scenarios whereby the care providers were to practice different simulation, managing them, learning, making mistakes which were allowed so that they can learn from them. And as they replicate this in their daily life, they're able to manage well their patients. So each facility received about one simulation per month, teamwork activities, several knowledge reviews with the skills, in addition to bedside mentoring and quality improvement, improvement activities. Next. So in Pronto International is a non Pronto International is a non profit next next part. So as we can see, training of Pronto mentors included pro, uh, providers, bedside mentoring, and knowledge reviews. It uh, emphasized so much on BMOC. It included standard BMOC content, whereby that is basic emergency obstetric and neonatal context, such as postpartum hemorrhage, preeclampsia, neonatal resuscitation. But in this context, we emphasize so much on prematurity related into a pattern and immediate postnatal care practices, whereby we talked about or mentored about assessment of gestational age, identification of preterm labor, and synergy with the modified safe child, uh, safe child by checklist, which have already been mentioned. Next. So, this targeted, the training targeted maternity ward and newborn care provider, as mentioned, together with quality improvement mentors. The curriculum was designed to cover 58 hours of pronto activities in our facilities, and it has to be 12 weeks of institute training and mentorship per facility. The mentors, went to a facility every week after, every, uh, after one month. And during this period, they did all the pronto activities, staying in a facility for a full week, returning to the facility after one month, covering all the 12 facilities, 12 weeks in a facility. Next. So the simulation, 
Pronto simulation curriculum. It covered 12 simulations, which we call them simpunk. So these simpunks are simulations that the healthcare providers were doing. And it was all about uh, the nurses doing simulation after receiving knowledge review and also after receiving skills of a particular obstetric emergency. For example, if it is a preeclampsia, they had to go through preeclampsia, they had to learn how to manage preeclampsia, then do a simulation. So the simulation, we call them CPAC, and they were 12, which were done in the 12 weeks rotationally in those facilities. I'll speak like CIMPAC 3, we had spontaneous vaginal deliv term delivery of a floppy baby with severe postpartum hemorrhage. This is a simulation whereby uh, providers were to manage a PPH with having a floppy baby after delivery. So are they able to do that? Are they able to manage? And this was just after knowledge reviews, after learning and mentorship of a whole week. So they replicate the knowledge they have received. How far have they learned? What can we improve from that? We have also like CIMPAC 5, severe preeclampsia and spontaneous preterm birth of 35 weeks, vaginal delivery of a floppy baby. So again, such. After receiving knowledge, they do a simulation about this. And the simulation were done in maternity, most exactly in labor ward if we have space. So this replicated exactly what happens in a facility. So when the care provider do a simulation, they are able to learn from that, learn from their mistakes, and when they get that scenario, they are able to manage it accordingly. Yes, next. So I hand over to Kevin to continue with Queer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annette and the team. So I'm going to present to you the last intervention, which was quality improvement uh, that looked at uh, the health, uh, healthcare system uh, bottlenecks that would impede the quality of care. Next. So uh, the core activities of quality improvement involve creation or strengthening facility quality improvement teams that comprise of about three to 12 people, depending on the size of the facility. The small facilities had fewer people in the quality improvement teams, and the larger facilities had more people. And these teams discussed uh, and followed up a uh, uh, plan, do, study, act uh, model uh, as they sought through the healthcare systems to tease out uh, health system uh, bottlenecks. So we tracked about uh, four indicators three that were common in both countries, Kenya and Uganda. So this was a situational age documentation in the maternity register. And then there was provision of antenatal corticosteroids, and then kangaroo mother care uh, practice. And then for Kenya only, we had a uh, completion of the safety and birth checklist. So through quality improvement, we also established uh, country-specific learning sessions these learning sessions had these quality improvement indicators that were being tracked uh, as a result of change ideas uh, that were uh, generated from the facilities. Next. So who are our target uh, areas? So we focused on uh, frontline healthcare providers in maternity ward and new, newborn care units. We also focused on the leadership uh, at the facility. Uh, we also had quality improvement meetings that took place in the facilities every two weeks. Uh, lastly, we had uh, learning sessions 
that occurred every four to six months in the I mean, uh, at a centralized venue where the facilities came together and learned from each other. So we had about five quality improvement learning sessions that were conducted during the entire trial. Next. So I just want to give us a few examples of uh, some of the improvements that we had as a result of quality improvement. So you can see on the photo uh, how the kangaroo mother care at Migori County referral looks like before the change idea was actually isolated and worked on. And then you can see also now photos showing mothers enjoying their beds in the kangaroo mother care rooms. Uh, and you can see a mother down there with the twins, really feeling nice in the kangaroo care uh, room. Next. Uh, the second quality uh, improvement uh, that uh, intervention was done was uh, on thermal regulation. We realized that most of the maternity wards or the labor rooms had very low temperatures, they were very cold. And this was not suitable for preterm babies. So we took one experiment at a So I think Kevin has a problem with the internet. So we did uh, uh, an experiment to see whether we can do uh, thermal regulation. Uh, we found the hospital and uh, renovated the room. You can see on one side the above that would actually. So I think Kevin has a problem with the network. So, uh, so this is an example of uh, one of the QI change ideas that we did uh, uh, to try and have uh, this uh, a properly uh, insulated room so that we can have the regulation uh, within the newborn uh, unit. Next slide, please. So I'm going to invite Peter, uh, who is our colleague from Uganda, uh, to take us through the results. Peter, please. Thank you so much. Um, and greetings from Uganda. I'm going to be taking you through the results of this study. Next slide. So as you can see, we started with uh, 23 facilities in order to determine our 28-day outcome among almost 3,000 eligible newborns. Uh, these 23 facilities, uh, three were eliminated because they could not be marked. They were large facilities. And we remained with 20 facilities, which we pair marked and randomized. These facilities had almost 60,000 register entries. Uh, the, the 20 facilities were later randomized into intervention control, where we had 10 intervention facilities and the 10 control facilities. We excluded all full terms and all macerated uh, stillbirth. And all those babies whose birth weight was less than 1,000 grams in the primal analysis. In terms of consenting, this being uh, quite uh, in a real life setting, we consented about 60%, 66% of eligible infants in the intervention sites and 60% uh, in the control sites. Um, also, we ended up in, uh, with about uh, 1,500 uh, babies in each group. Uh, we had some lost fall up, which was about 12% in the intervention group and 8% in the um, control facilities. Um, next. So um, in terms of um, uh, when you look at the randomization was quite successful because if you look at, uh, at the facility characteristics, these were similar in both intervention 
and the control. Um, for instance, uh, in terms of uh, mass delivery volumes, uh, deliveries uh, to staff ratio, in terms of steel, steel bus proportion, and also low bus weight proportion, and pre-discharge uh, neonatal mortality, there are no major differences between uh, the intervention and control facilities. Next. Also, when we, 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 we compared uh, maternal and infant characteristics across the study arms, again, there was no difference in terms of maternal age, in terms of multiple gestation, but also in terms of infant characteristics, like uh, low birth weight rates, but also in, in terms of gestation age and uh, the sex of the infant. There were no differences. Suggesting that actual randomization was quite successful. Next slide. Here we present our main uh, finding, where we see that our full intervention package was able to reduce the odds of um, combined first two births and neonatal mortality among eligible infants by a whole 34% compared with uh, the control group. And uh, you, you can see the, the details of these results in the table. These results were adjusted for pairing and for cluster. Uh, we also did further um, adjustment for C-section, for infant sex, for multiplicity, but also in terms of country, uh, in terms of uh, birth weight delivery and in, of, of the facilities that uh, we worked with. So despite all this um, uh, adjustment, the results remained quite strong. Next. And uh, you, you can say that um, these results, are, as we said before, the main outcome was the combined fresh stillbirth um, uh, plus the 28 day uh, mortality among uh, eligible infants, where we had uh, that uh, strong uh, outcome. But uh, our intervention uh, worked across the continuum of care. We reduced uh, fresh stillbirth rates also reduced significant uh, pre-discharge mortality, and uh, we also reduced trend day mortality and the perinatal mortality. It is quite interesting that uh, uh, the trend 80 day mortality uh, was uh, uh, significantly reduced, uh, yet our intervention was only in the facilities, meaning that um, this intervention effects had the um, influence over beyond the facility, even after discharge. I think this stay of mothers in facilities, especially uh, preterms in facilities, benefits them and they learn uh, on how to care for the baby uh, to the extent that uh, the effect is felt even after discharge. Next. Now, um, there were, if you look at the result further, there is um, a lot of variation uh, of outcomes. Uh, by the facility type, um, as expected, because we had uh, 20 facilities which were of valid uh, capacity and size. Uh, but the gains in survival across these individual facilities are uh, deferred, especially in the three uh, intervention facilities uh, where there were quite significant changes. But um, we were able to do uh, a sensitivity analysis um, with these three facilities excluded to see whether we, it makes any difference. And what we remained with was quite still significant results, meaning that uh, the ob we observed no differences in the overall results. So um, the intervention and the, the trial design was quite strong. Next. Now, uh, you would wonder, uh, was this the case in, uh, in Kenya and uh, Uganda? The, the, the effect was, a, was similar in both Uganda and Kenya, as in, in terms of overall reduction in um, um, these rates. But Uganda facilities tended to have a much higher um, reduction compared to Kenya. But there are some differences between uh, Uganda facilities and the Kenyan facilities. The Uganda facilities were larger, were about 2.7 uh, times uh, 
are bigger in terms of the volume of um, uh, patients they, they care for compared to Kenyan facilities. All the Ghana health facilities, as opposed to Kenya, had C-section capacity. And um, although Uganda health facilities had lower facility readiness scores at baseline. So um, I think this intervention is uh, much significant if it is done in the hospitals and the those larger level facilities, which have more patients, but also more staff and more readiness. Next. And uh, again, we say uh, in this slide, basically reflecting what I've said before, that the effect in Kenya and Uganda was similar, but the intervention effect was higher in Uganda than uh, it was in Kenya. Next. Um, as I said before, that uh, the intervention uh, had impact across the board, um, uh, um, like uh, it all, all of us benefited from the exposure to the package. As we said before, we're able to reduce a significant uh, the fresh tube bus uh, mortality, but also the predischarge uh, mortality. Uh, so this intervention, uh, this package is useful to the mother, to, uh, although we don't show these results um, and you didn't have the power, but, uh, but, but also it is useful to all types of of uh, babies uh, in reducing first year births, but also in reducing uh, mortality due to prematurity and the mortality before discharge, but also as we saw, uh, mortality after discharge. Next. Now, like all studies, our study had some limitations. And um, um, one of them, the study um, used the gestation age as a uh, idea, which would be the ideal uh, uh, marker for determining prematurity. But we did a study in the real world um, circumstances. Uh, gestation age is difficult to measure, especially in our settings in Uganda, Kenya, Africa, but also South Asia, where ultrasound in the first trimester would be the gold standard, but it is unavailable. Uh, so we were able to use um, birth weight, but also uh, estimates of gestation age. Uh, and by doing so, we saw that our composite measure for prematurity, which was the combined uh, birth weight and recorded gestation age, was able to capture the most vulnerable uh, babies uh, in this case. Uh, so that was one limitation, but we tried to deal with it in uh, trying to find the best way to measure uh, prematurity. The second limitation that we had is that we used existing health facility data, as my colleague um, Anthony was able to, to show uh, before. Uh, that has limitations in terms of uh, measurement. And uh, as I presented before, uh, we missed uh, uh, getting outcomes in about a third of um, those that um, uh, babies who had been in those facilities. But as uh, I explained, this uh, study was quite Powerful, we're able to show differences in different outcomes um, uh, that uh, are presented before. And we're able to, uh, to also analyze, was there a difference between babies that were included and those that were excluded? When we looked at, the, at this, we found that there were no significant differences in these babies in terms of like uh, the neonatal mortality rate, uh, maternal mortality, maternal age, uh, C-section rates, but also in terms of gestation, multiple gestation, and the, in terms of infant sex or gestation age, suggesting that uh, although there might be selection bias, it was quite uh, limited, but uh, of course we cannot rule it out completely. Um, so regardless of these limitations, uh, with all the adjustments that we did, we found that uh, our results remained quite strong and they have implications on how to uh, address the issue of prematurity and the, therefore newborn uh, mortality uh, in Uganda, in Kenya, and the, in similar settings. And we hope uh, policymakers will take these results uh, forward and scale them up. I will now invite my colleague, uh, Professor 
uh, Dennis Walker, who was actually the overall PI, to uh, make the rest of the presentation. Thanks very much, Peter, and the rest of the team. And I think I'm just going to provide a few kind of contextual remarks to hopefully get the um, virtual discussion going here. Uh, but as you can imagine, our teams have spent a lot of time thinking about just why did this all work and work so well. Um, to reiterate, it led to a reduction in fresh stillbirth and pre-discharge mortality among preterms, but it also seemed to impact all births, particularly that uh, um, in decreasing still fresh stillbirths. So what does that mean? It means that providers in these facilities were taking more care during the intrapartum period and particularly at the moment of resuscitation, they decided that they would make every attempt to save these particularly small and vulnerable babies. Uh, next slide, please. So what was it about this full package that led to these providers to sort of make that split section, split second decision often at the moment of birth to do everything they could. And the, um, my colleagues have presented each of the components of the package. And I just want to reiterate that all of the facilities, all 20 of the facilities had data strengthening and the safe childbirth checklist. And it was only in the intervention facilities that those QI collaboratives and the pronto simulation team training mentorship was added on. However, you can see that this was not four siloed interventions. Each of the interventions was carefully designed to interact very intentionally with the other components of the interventions, such that they could be reinforced and um, reiterated. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of critical factors as to what we think, and we have lots of lots of process data that we've been um, looking at, that helped implement this complex intervention package. And I think the first is around visibility. Um, defining the issue sparks change. So we needed to start by naming pre prematurity as an important issue and placing value on a preterm life. Um, and this really can mark that first critical stage in the evolution of achieving gains, believing that there is um, are preterm infants that can be saved and that it is important that everyone um, does what they can. The next component is teamwork. Um, we felt that establishing these regional peer networks for providers and facilities through the QI teams, through the Pronto mentorship, created more confident, more accountable, and more supported communities. And that was critical to the success. And finally, engagement. We really relied on the engagement of the Ministry of Health stakeholders before any of this started, before even what we decided what to do. Um, we had their input on um, determining what the focus of the entire preterm birth initiative would be. Uh, we relied on local leadership throughout the study and the dissemination period, and we continue to rely on them today. Hope some of them are on the line with us. Um, we really hope that this can spread to other counties, um, as you see how it, how it has been so extremely effective. Next slide, please. So by, we believe that by naming the condition, preterm birth, we increase visibility of the problem leading to better counting. By better counting and then teaching providers how to care for these vulnerable infants, we increased knowledge. And that translated into increased use of evidence-based practices like anonatal corticosteroids, KMC, immediate resuscitation. And of note, we did not introduce any high-tech equipment or supplies. There were no new preterm related technologies introduced throughout this um, intervention. And we think that these happened, um, but why did, they, why did they then change? We think that this created a continuous cycle that helped build provider confidence. It shifted attitudes which then led them to make a different decision when presented with a small fragile baby and feel that they could improve that child's outcome, 
that would then be reflected in the data, they would get greater visibility, and it created this continuous loop or sort of ecosystem of change and improvement. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to my colleague, Nelly, uh, Felgona, I believe Felgona comes next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So as I uh, summarize, I just want to say that, uh, um, just to summarize for those who came in late particularly, that our full interview package reduced fresh stillbirth and neonatal mortality among eligible infants from 23.3 to 53 percent and this has been published in was published in ACAS in the Lancet Global Health you can pull it up and read more detail and it indeed it came even with an accompanying support documentary now um, in my next slide next slide please Okay. Uh, my next slide, I just want to appreciate the people who uh, supported the work that made this work, as starting off with our sponsor, the Bill Melinda Gate Foundation, and then the whole uh, great team of advisory board, right from the US, uh, the national level, the, the county and regional levels. You really want to thank them so much. We also want to thank the Migori County Health officials, and I, I think I have, we have some on board. I saw so Dr. Iska, we want to appreciate you, and uh, BT Solo, we want to appreciate the Migori team who have logged on, went to uh, attend this meeting. We want to appreciate the, our various ministries of health from Kenya and even Uganda. We had a, a whole lot of uh, engagement with administrators and leaders in the facilities and at various levels. And this work would not be accessed without the research team um, represented here. We want to thank them all, uh, together with all our implementers, and I've seen several of them online. And I just want to appreciate you so much. Next slide. Next slide. So I want to end with this quote, which came from one of our uh, facility uh, sub-county uh, official who said that the success story for us here is the facility has a preterm section, the first one of its kind here. Mothers are now happy that even if they deliver preterm babies, chances of going home with live babies are high. The mothers of preterm babies had no hope before the preterm birth initiative project, but now they have hope. Thank you very much. Um, I will now turn back the mic to Dr. Nelly to take us through the discussions. We have the next slide for that transition. Thank you. Thank you to our team of presenters. I really want to say I always get excited about the PTBI work. And it's such a nice reminder that we can change the outcomes for our patients, even in the most rural unit, by implementing simple things that are locally available and make such a huge difference. I think a third reduction of mortality is huge. And during some of these preterm birth initiative days, when the mothers came with their babies, the joy in their faces is huge. So um, on that note, I would like to invite members to come up with questions for discussion. I think we had a question about duration of follow-up, which we were responded to was 28 days. Um, then we, had an, we have another comment. Um, about the importance of the safe childbirth checklist, which is a World Health Organization tool. Um, and it's actually not widely used and we should use it. And it really does make a difference, yeah. And Professor Rachel Musoke, who's been with us from the very beginning, renowned pediatrician unitologist, 
has thanked everybody and she was such a champion and a member of the national advisory team. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Then we have a question from Philip Wanduru. What was the cost for facility-based interventions? How about household burden in terms of caring for such children, neonatal, postnatal, and beyond? Um, maybe one of the members of our panelists would like to respond to that question. Well, uh, Peter here, and uh, Philip is a colleague here um, who is doing studies on uh, severe bus asphyxia trying to look at outcomes. I think that is why he's interested in uh, the cost of families. So having known that the intervention is uh, effective, we are now doing the costing uh, to find out how much does it cost and we shall be able to provide a cost effective um, outcome uh, of uh, the work. So right now, we don't know. But I think it is an important question that um, uh, when other babies survive, uh, the care is meant to be continued for a long time. That is most important uh, in the first two years of life. And from other work that we are doing, we've seen uh, both in Uganda and in Kenya, we know that when babies survive, especially when they are severely preterm, sometimes they have complications that might affect their neural development. Uh, in other words, I think we, we, although we can say preterms in hospitals, we need to build a package that continues um, way beyond facilities into communities and longer term follow up. But really, programs have shown that when you provide uh, preterms a holistic, package, they can actually be as productive and sometimes are free of um, any disability. So I think that is what I could answer on uh, Flippo's question. And the other thing which we, which, uh, we had as um, a limitation, and um, we have all these preterms, but we, uh, ideally we should be following them up to find their out long-term outcomes. Some of the babies are now three, uh, making four years, but we don't have the resources to use this large cohort. Uh, remember, we had about 3,000 babies uh, who potentially could follow up and see how do they uh, perform later in life. I think they provide an opportunity. And we're able to show that these babies can be followed up. Most of the follow up that we did was by phone. And where phone was not possible, we were able to follow them up with a, a motorcycle. I think that is what I can say about Philip's question. Thank you. Okay, we have any other persons commenting on this survival and outcome? Yeah, I just wanted to add on what Peter has said um, that uh, uh, just to look out because we are actually doing a, a positiveness study uh, analysis on this. I think that might actually be able to answer that question uh, in a deeper, in, in, um, in more details. But just to add on what Peter has said about the importance of long-term follow-up, it's very, very important. In Kenya, we were able to do um, this a short study on trying to follow them up. Uh, we called it the h &D study, and uh, we will be publishing that uh, very soon. But we are at least able to track uh, a good number of them. So it's, it's true that it's possible to track them and uh, physically we call them to come in and we do neurodevelopmental assessment on them. But uh, with COVID, we are actually thinking that we can still do some phone interviews and, and try to track them down. So it's so important to know the long-term um, outcomes of babies. Thank you. And of course, we also know of some notable long-term survivors of preterm birth. I think many of us in our social circles know people who were born at one kilo, we have the famous whole baby from perhaps uh, Dr. Enwani will tell us, the famous KNH 400 gram baby who still um, comes, uh, is shown to us. So, but the point is well taken. Yeah. Then there's a question from Alphonse Nyaket uh, to Professor Peter Weiswa. As you compare results in both countries, kindly clarify on impact of industrial action on Kenyan results. That's a very tested time. 
Uh, well, um, I, 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 I'm sure I, I'll leave to the Kenyan team to answer that question. But um, um, the, as we said, we did this work in uh, uh, like a real life setting and things like strikes and stuff um, uh, could be possible. Um, in fact, even in Uganda, we had a very short strike period, but not as long as Kenya. And uh, definitely it impacted, um, especially utilization and stuff like that. Um, now, um, the, I think the thing I explained about Ugandan facilities, that uh, the, the most significant thing that we saw was that Uganda facilities were larger and uh, we uh, had more capacity for emergency uh, obstetric care and uh, also more like qualified staff in terms of doctors. Although actually in Kenyan midwives and nurses uh, are more qualified, actually Uganda nurses, I mean, uh, at certificate as opposed to Kenya where they are more experienced. So the major difference was uh, uh, the level of facility in Uganda compared to Kenya. Uh, but how the strike affected the outcome, I'll invite the Kenyan colleagues to uh, attempt that. Although I, I don't think we're able to measure the difference, but over to Fragona and colleagues. I don't know if I to answer that, but I think um, the person who asked that question was actually one of our uh, clinicians. Uh, who was involved in QI. So I, I guess he, he may be having some answers to what he observed during the strike. But uh, just to answer that we actually have not been able to tease out and look at that period, I think it would be interesting to look out and see. Uh, the only thing we were able to see was everything went down to zero in terms of you know, like the delivery. So it was very difficult to have a denominator, except the facilities, uh, the missionary facilities. So it was very hard to get figures to compare before and after. I think we have tried, we have one paper that we are writing, maybe it will be able to help us to, to present this. We are calling it the strike paper. So I, I think the team that is working on may be able to show us some, you know, some differences between what happened during this strike and, and just to bring out those, definitely the, the magnitude of the effect was great because we, we were more or less paralyzed. At some point, we all abandoned the study because a whole eight month period with no work. So, um, I don't have a story answer, but just comment. Okay, thank you. I also recall that period had an increase in a mother to child transmission of HIV. So perhaps, so we've been, you've been told it's quite exciting results and uh, thank you for the great work. Any learning experience that can be translated into policy change in the countries, in the counties that the study was done? Um, any chance that this will turn into policy? I know it's often outside the investigator's hands, but what can we do? No, I think for me, Peter here from Uganda, and um, um, like every researcher, uh, that is when you have a successful learning, uh, you always hope that uh, it translates into a uh, policy. And uh, one of the policy issues as presented by Dillis is really the power of a package, which includes uh, skills, uh, strengthening, but also measurement and engagement of leaders. Um, I think that's uh, one of the critical things because many times when we do QI, we focus like on one thing, then it is not effective but you need to look at um, a package. And that's quite important as countries try to uh, scale up uh, like the quality of care and, and network uh, that Uganda, Kenya, and other countries are part of. 
the, to identify a package of interventions. But actually one of the critical learnings is that uh, these um, learning simulations, I think can be applied across the board, not just for preterms, but in a clinical setting. In fact, maybe even more applicable today during uh, COVID, that how do we simulate and ensure that we limit um, uh, health workers getting infected, but uh, as we also have impacts. Now, um, what what we be part of the, one of the reasons we are doing this presentation is actually to uh, really influence policymakers, and the, we are calling upon the policymakers out there who are listening to learn from this package and ask us more more questions, follow up, so that uh, these things can be. Uh, help scale up because we have the SDG targets for uh, newborns. How shall we achieve them without implementation? Now, my final one is uh, my frustration. Actually, I've been saying this that one of the frustrating things is that uh, uh, in many countries in Uganda and Kenya, successful studies rarely translate into uh, becoming a policy or, most importantly, a program. That remains a critical barrier. We need to learn from local evidence and be able to use it to drive our programming. Uh, so that is uh, my call. So uh, we are also trying to engage the Uganda stakeholders. In two weeks time, we shall be presenting this again to Uganda stakeholders. And now we are presenting mainly to Kenyans, but also to a global audience. So, so we need to continue uh, this engagement so that uh, these findings uh, influence. One of the positive things I'm happy about is that um, where we did the work in Uganda, actually the implementation has gone on. And the, the, the health workers provided, I mean from the WhatsApp group, uh, which I'm part of, and you'll be amazed, these over 200 health workers very active discussing uh, the care. In one hospital, uh, there is, you'll be happy to learn that uh, they have actually built a large uh, neonatal unit because of advocacy from uh, those who became champions, which I think is part of that policy uh, influence and influence on the programming. Over. Okay, I think I couldn't agree with you more. There's very little advocacy for reproductive and maternal child health, and it's a space that many of us could engage in. Uh, Dr. Onyori, you've been quiet. Before we go to Dr. Felgona, would you like to add to this? Piece? Yeah, maybe I would add on the Kenyan side. Uh, one on the issue: what 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 are some of the lessons that we have learned, especially on survival after discharge? One of the resources that uh, we have not been using that we used uh, quite effectively. Uh, during the implementation of this study uh, on the follow-up aspect is the use of community health volunteers. And this is a critical resource that can actually be integrated into follow-up to uh, ensure that these uh, small babies uh, 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 go back or are followed properly, they, 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 they get the immunization, the weight is, uh, uh, is checked, uh, things like uh, their nutrition is also kept, uh, uh, at, I mean, uh, kept uh, uh, constant at, 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 at a level that every person knows that, yes, this baby is, is really uh, doing well and surviving. So uh, the community health volunteer can be used, and uh, I think, uh, for, uh, to ensure that these children survive. The other thing is, of course, the issue of uh, data strengthening. Uh, people have come to realize that uh, the data generated in our facilities has a lot of gaps. And uh, when people are implementing such uh, a, a, a study, they should try as much as possible not to create other systems because it will be very easy to go with the defined uh, 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 variables and a defined system of getting your, uh, your, your, your data, then immediately you leave. But when you are doing such a study, I think one of the other lessons that we have learned is that strengthening the systems uh, within the health facility is more variable to a country or to a facility and to the country than creating uh, new, uh, uh, new systems. Thank you.
Uh, I think that's very valuable. And, and it's, you know, I think we need to also just recognize the strength from within. Migori is really rural. And we, we didn't import tech, we didn't import people. We just, it was local people, people like Annette, right? Teaching pronto in Migori and, and changing outcomes. That's amazing. Dr. Felgona. No, I just to... wanted to add that uh, we, we are happy to report here that uh, Migori County actually was also able to pick up quite a bit of these interventions that are running with them. Maybe not exactly as we did in the, in the project, but to a great extent, which is quite good to report. They are doing a lot with the, they have new checklists that they are using. They are uh, picking up pronto and of course data strengthened, already well established. So they are picking and going on with it, as well as uh, KY, which they already were very much interested in. So I think this is just a call for the other county follow suit. And, and just, just like what Dilly said, you know, just bringing the idea up and creating a culture where people can always be conscious about quality of care and, and seeing that this can have great impact is, is a great thing to know. So I, I think this is just a call and, 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 and something that we can say that uh, Migori is a case study that you can mirror. Thank you. And it's one of the counties with one of the highest infant mortalities. So this, this is good. So there was a question on what support from Susan Irungo, what support do you propose would be necessary in preventing both discharge mortalities at the community level? Maybe we can discuss a bit of kangaroo care. Who, who would like to take that? Reducing post-discharge mortality. It wasn't, I mean, we went up to 28 days, which was post-discharge. You know, yeah, I could also, uh, I was, okay. go, go on, Nick. No, I was going to call upon Professor Musoke because I know she talked a lot about this and she was very um, involved, though she's not on the screen. And she was part of the advisory board. Okay. I, I okay. don't know if we have a microphone because she's an Go ahead, Dr. Fagun. Now, just saying that, um, yeah, I think one of the things uh, going beyond post this time, just as you could see from our presentation, that we definitely had an effect. Uh, the interventions had effects even beyond this time already. So it's all about uh, what what did the mothers pick? Um, how would they respond? That checklist had uh, quite a bit on what to do post charge. What, how do they uh, notice danger signs and what, how do they respond to those danger signs? So those are you know, typically simple and very um, not much intense. But uh, if you were to do a lot more in the community, I think, um, our idea still uh, will pay on the CHVs. And uh, even right now, we did um, a lot of, um, you know, like mobile um, platforms will be important. But uh, the basic things that we do for the preterms, like the kangaroo mother care, were already in ingrained in some of our package the interventions. Yeah, so thermal regulation with kangaroo care, um, okay, which can be shared with other parents. And I know there's a program in Kenya that was really promoting um, the kangaroo mother care, parent care. Okay. Um, Maybe I can comment a bit on uh, this issue, yes. Peter here. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the learnings, as Fragona said, is that uh, uh, one, it's, you know, Peter and Bath is, not planned for <laughs> and for it, it just occurs and that's a, a shock to parents but good enough if they're in facilities then um, there is an opportunity to take care of them and prepare them so i think to save babies after discharge it starts in uh, the facility how do you prepare these parents so that uh, they are ready for discharge now this not just the baby but also the the parents and uh, many times just focus on the mother but she's going back to a community. 
where she, she needs to be ready to, to continue the care. So one preparation uh, in the facility. The second thing I want to talk about is actually the social issues that happens. And I think this is where we have a challenge with um, our care systems, that we meet uh, 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 parents, mothers in the facilities, but we, and they come dressed up clean and you know, make up, but we don't know what kind of home they are going to. <laughs> so I think the social issues needs to be addressed. Uh, one time I wanted actually to have a student to go and photograph the homes where preterms are going back to, so that we get to, to understand what, what kind of, of home, what is its cleanliness, is there social support, these issues of, of stigma, the workload that parents have, and you know, where is this baby going to be? Is the baby going to be in a, a room with, um, with smoke? You know, those issues that are quite bad to babies. So I think we need to do more to understand the social context and prepare parents uh, accordingly, which also goes with KMC. KMC has been shown through a large trial done in uh, India, not yet actually done in Africa, um, uh, that uh, it, it has actually a huge impact on uh, mortality in the, even when done in the, in the community. And finally, the issue of cost. I think we need, I don't know, we, we, we provide uh, vouchers for mothers to deliver in facilities, and yet they have nine months to prepare. But actually, uh, preterm care is quite costly even in our context. Uh, in fact, one of the small studies we did in this work by one of my colleagues, Doris, who is also my PhD student, she finds that it is quite costly for parents. Every time you tell them to come back, it is a cost. And they, 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 it takes away a lot of the time uh, for them to do productive things because they have to focus. So I think maybe we should do also advocate uh, for uh, that preterms are vulnerable and uh, the parents can easily go into poverty and they need uh, special support. I think those are some of the issues that uh, we need to be uh, working with, plus of course, a good follow-up program by uh, health workers and community health workers. Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter. So I love at the community level. I'd like to actually move a little bit. We have a few minutes left, and I'd like to move more to the obstetric side of things and ask about um, whether the package had an impact on caesarean section rates or maternal mortality. D Dilys, perhaps you could talk to us about that. Um, yeah, thanks very much, Nelly. And, and please, Falgona, Peter, um, chime in here. Our, our study wasn't powered to assess impact, but it didn't impact cesarean section rates. So we know that um, one of the things we were a little bit concerned about was that if we suddenly put a lot of focus on these preterm infants and preterm labor, that there may be actually an uptick in cesarean section rates for babies that potentially could not be saved. And what we found was that did not happen. Um, there was no kind of um, unexpected downward impact on cesarean section rates. In terms of maternal outcomes, again, it's really hard to be powered for this. It did, did look like there were fewer maternal deaths in the intervention, but it's really hard to say anything meaningful about that. I think this issue of um, you know, an increased focus on intrapartum care and also an understanding of um, this shifting viability, you, I, I certainly felt that many of the providers through the course of the study, began to believe that smaller babies were more likely to survive and were making more greater efforts to them to an extent, but they weren't jumping all the way to cesarean section for those very, very small babies that were unlikely to survive and may actually have created worse outcomes for the mothers. Um, I think it's a topic area that deserves a lot of additional um, investigation. We're looking at, um, cesarean sections currently and at, uh, among the entire study population to, to sort of glean some of the insights around that. It's tough balance, right? Because traditionally the textbooks tell you to do a cesarean section for extreme preterms, but, but uh, survival rates are poor or we've just had follow-up care and complication get high. So we have like about eight minutes and, and I want to hear a little bit from Sorry, I was just going to reiterate yes. that, that in this study, it didn't look like that happened. They didn't 
become overly aggressive with those particularly small preterm babies. So that's really That's actually excellent especially in Uganda where they have more access to the cesarean section. So very quickly, the last thing I want to ask, did the intervention package, no, among these four components, we have four key components to this PTBI initiative package. Does any one of you have a sense if one component contributed more to this change than the others? So if you're a policy maker, you know, would you say, we should do data strengthening. Should we do more pronto simulation? Can, can we be piggy one of them, of the interventions, if you had to pick? Is, is this something that we can tease apart? And which one is most sustainable? Easy to implement, you know, amongst our listeners, you want to go to your facility, change something. What would you propose? <laughs> Wow, that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, yes. But uh, when you look at it, this basically was a package and maybe you may not be able to tweak and say this, this contributed more than this. But maybe on my part, on the part that I was leaving, I know that, uh, of course, uh, the modified safe childbirth checklist, I can say what probably did not seem to work very well. Uh, one, of course, when you look at uh, uh, something like data strengthening, it was taken very well and uh, the facilities felt that this is something that was not adding a burden to them. But uh, in our setup in Kenya, and of course in many countries, you'll find that uh, the WHO uh, safe, uh, safe uh, child by checklist has not been very well uh, undertaken. And uh, in, in initially, of, uh, in where we were implementing this, uh, the, the fa uh, facility staff felt that this is a tool uh, that we are using to, uh, to collect data. And until we explain to them that the, this is not a tool, uh, this, we are not relying on this tool uh, to collect data, but it is a quality, a sort of quality improvement tool. That's when uh, they started uh, picking, I mean, taking it up. But when you look at it, uh, basically, Uh, is it me who's frozen or is it Dr. Wanyoro? Okay, so we are getting close to the hour and our panelists have really stayed with us along the way. There, there are a lot more questions we'd like to discuss and encourage people to send in their questions and also look up the Lancet, the Lancet Global Health publication that details a lot and expect to hear a lot more from, from this work and think about which of these packages you can start with? Whether it's thermal regulation, kangaroo care, pronto, you want to hear more about pronto simulation, whether it's for the infant care, whether it's for maternal obstetric care, please go to the PTBI website and feel free to contact this team. We would like to see this move forward and change lives and improve healthcare. So with those remarks, I'd really, it's my great, great pleasure to introduce my long-term colleague, Dr. Irene Inwani, the Deputy Director, Clinical Services, Kenyatta National Hospital, and um, <clears throat> one of the members of our National Advisory Board. Thank you, Irene Karibu Sana. Uh, Asante Sana Nelly, good evening everybody. It's a real, a real pleasure and I'm humbled and honored to give this uh, closing remark uh, to this presentation of this landmark study. It really feels like a breath of fresh air to get this result as we celebrate the, the preterm, the International Preterm Day. Uh, this year's uh, theme was uh, Together for the Baby is Born Too Soon, caring for the future. Uh, this uh, study truly aligns well with the focus this year of supporting families, uh, supporting healthcare professionals, 
and strengthening healthcare systems. I will not repeat because of time uh, what the speakers actually presented to us, but it is truly amazing uh, how this very well executed uh, implementation of science research uh, has managed to achieve. And some of the things we should take home truly is that it is possible. Uh, the engagement disability. I know we come from an African culture where we can actually take up to five days to name a baby. And the hesitancy mainly is because of the preterm birth. Yeah. The survival is expected to actually be uh, very poor. And this team managed to engage the community not only for their buy-in, but to work as partners. For those who are asking about the post-discharge survival, it's because this team engaged the community right from the word go. So they had the community buy-in. They built capacity not only for the healthcare workers in the facilities, but also in the community. And I think this has contributed to great results that we are actually receiving today. Uh, we have actually now local data, which I'm truly excited about, on how we can implement uh, these interventions, evidence-based interventions, to actually uh, tackle this mammoth problem. Uh, Preterm birth. Uh, are actually real in our setting. Uh, we are facing a pandemic, COVID-19, and the preterm births will continue. Human beings, uh, the business of making babies will continue. We have seen a lot of teenage pregnancy. We have seen people are locked in the houses. Uh, the economic um, empowerment has actually been eroded, and therefore the contribution of all the factors to preterm birth will, will be seen and will continue to be seen uh, and in the future to come. And we have seen that we can actually uh, do very simple interventions which are evidence-based and achieve great results. Uh, this um, PTI initiative was actually implemented in the real life setting in our setups. Uh, what truly we would want to hear is the rest of the people. We, this was very uh, based in the counties where we have, uh, which are envisioned as a high, uh, the counties which contribute to high burden of the preterm uh, mortality. But we know that even in the towns, even in the private facilities, uh, we are losing a very big proportion of the preterm uh, children. So as one of the board members, I know we followed very closely how the interventions were implemented and we followed closely so that the fidelity and the ethics were actually maintained. And this shows that it is actually possible. It is actually feasible to actually implement it. People have been asking during the discussion is how much will it cost? The sustainability of these interventions. Do we have a transition plan to the county government? And as it has been asked, uh, I believe the institutions involved are actually tasked to actually participate in the national uh, health planning and therefore we are expecting some briefs from this um, study and hoping that uh, they can be answered, they can be rolled out and the questions that have not been answered by this study will actually uh, be answered. Uh, with a world where we're actually losing about 15 million babies pre born prematurely uh, every year. We cannot uh, relax. 
we cannot win the battle. We will never achieve the global targets uh, which were set uh, to achieve uh, the reduction of uh, chicken mortality by 2030 because the preterns contribute uh, the highest burden to this group. So we have actually seen that with very simple tools, what is the gestation wheel? Where can it be implemented? Uh, the tape measures, uh, the dashboards. Actually, this is implementable all the way up to the community. We have seen innovative ways of actually building capacity at all levels of healthcare, all the way up to the community. And this also can be uh, in the whole country and in the different settings. Uh, I think this study uh, makes us rethink as we invest, as we have got a very limited budget for healthcare, which are the interventions that we can adopt and make the biggest impact in terms of reducing the mortality in the maternal and neonatal mortality uh, in our city. Uh, I know uh, Nelly mentioned about our baby, the 400. Now we have got two of them. The first one is almost seven years old. We celebrate her birthday every year. We are celebrating the second birthday of the second. Oh, Dr. Inwani, did we lose you? All right. So I think we are at 2033. And for the people in Kenya, it's um, if they didn't have an early dinner, they'll need to go for dinner. But I couldn't possibly thank the PTBI team enough. I couldn't thank, oh good, you're there now. Okay. You can close. So I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, what I would call upon is uh, the team to actually develop some policy briefs so that we can actually push for the rollout of this intervention. Hmm. Dr. Inwani? Uh, to be done in our settings, the PIs, the study team, and the research participants. Thank you very much. And we are looking forward to more of the publication and completion of the gaps that have currently been identified. Thank you very much. And back to you, Dr. Mugen. I just want to say this, even though it's not part of PTBA, that Dr. Irini Nwani is the first Deputy Director of Medical Services female in Kenyatta. So as we celebrate other wins um, in the US for the first women something, we also celebrate her and her work in Kenyatta. So thank you very much. And uh, I think Dillis, I would like you to close the session for us. Oh, well, that's very kind of you, Nelly, and I, I appreciate it. I have been sitting here um, just um, amazed at the leadership and the dedication and the commitment to this topic area about my, from my global, global colleagues. And certainly it was the package, but it was also the leadership and the team that implemented it across both of those countries that made this a reality. And I hope that we really can push to make this something that is replicated in other counties across Kenya and Uganda. And I just wanna thank you all and thank you for listening. Thank you. And congratulations to the PTBI team and thank you to the audience. And good night, good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Nelly. Thank you Nelly.